Well, the word salt conjures in mind perhaps images of the ocean and the stuff that we put in our food. But salt is actually also very important for industry and also for the energy transition. So let's explore salt, what it is and where it comes from. The type of salt we are most familiar with is the common table salt, sodium chloride, also known as halite. When you think about it, it's quite remarkable that you can take two pretty unfriendly elements like the extremely flammable sodium and the poisonous chlorine and combine them to make something that is not only suitable for eating, but actually essential for our well-being. The human body requires a small amount of salt or sodium to be exact for proper nerve and muscle function and maintaining optimal balance of water and other minerals. But salt comes in many guises. Sodium chloride isn't the only type of salt and human nutrition and well-being is far from the largest commercial application of salt. Salts are used widely in the industry, including in energy production and storage. But before we discuss these, let's quickly have a look at what salt actually is. In this video, we focus on salts where positively charged ions combine with chlorine. But in chemistry, any compound consisting of positively and negatively charged ions with no net electric charge is technically a salt. As such, there are hundreds of compounds that are salts, although we don't usually think of them as such. For example, calcium carbonate, which is used in cement, is chemically a type of salt. But even in the world of chlorine salts, sodium chloride isn't the only game in town. Instead of sodium, you can have almost any iron with a positive charge, such as potassium or magnesium, or even silver. Many of these are used in food and particularly in animal feeds, as potassium and magnesium, for example, are important nutritional elements. The greatest single use of chloride salts is the production of chemicals, particularly sodium hydroxide and chlorine. Other important uses include de-icing roads in winter, as salt lowers the freezing point of water, so it prevents slippery ice forming onto the road surfaces. But salt also has important and perhaps surprising applications in energy production and storage like solar power. When we think about solar energy, we usually think about solar panels made out of photovoltaic cells that capture the energy of the sun and transform it into electricity. But there is another way to harness the power of the sun. This is the Nor Solar Power Station in Morocco. It covers an area of about 30 square kilometers and is one of the largest solar power complexes in the world. A large proportion of the energy production here comes from conventional solar panels, but there is something else here too. Something that looks straight out of a sci-fi movie. This is a so-called concentrated solar power system or CSP. A CSP consists of a central tower surrounded by circles of mirrors or lenses that concentrate sunlight into the central tower. This thermal energy can then be used to drive turbines that generate electricity. But the really neat thing is that the energy from the sunlight can be stored in the central tower and that's where the salt comes in. The receivers in the central tower can be filled with salt, which melts with the energy collected from the sun. The temperature of the molten salt can be as high as 1000 degrees Celsius. So this melting process essentially stores the energy, and this energy is released during the night when it's cooler to drive the turbines. 
so you can get solar energy around the clock. The technology is still developing and only a fraction of solar energy is currently produced by CSP systems, but new projects are being built all over the world. Data and analytics company Global Data estimates that global CSP capacity will increase from 5.6 gigawatts in 2018 to 22.4 gigawatts in 2030. And then there are batteries. We probably usually think about metals such as lithium, lead or nickel when it comes to batteries. But in fact, you can use salt to make batteries too. And there already are batteries that are based on sodium. The working principle of a sodium ion battery is very similar to a lithium ion battery, except that it is sodium ions rather than lithium that carry the charge. You still need metals like manganese, nickel and cobalt in the cathode, but eliminating lithium from the battery makes it a lot cheaper. The downside is that sodium ion batteries have a much lower energy density than lithium ion batteries, so they are basically less powerful for the same size of battery. But sodium ion batteries are already being used in, for example, stationary energy storage in the energy grid, where the weight and volume of a battery is less of an issue. But there may be potential to make these batteries more efficient, potentially usable in things like electric vehicles, and several companies are developing the technology. But now let's leave the beach and go have a look at the salt mine. I'm in southern Portugal and a grey rainy day like this is perfect for going down into an enormous hole in the ground, which is exactly what you can find in the city of Lule, just north of Faro. Texalt, the company operating the mine, organises public tours into the mine since 2019. In 2022, there were 12,000 visitors to the mine and interest is growing. Right, so, as always, when you're going into a mine, a bunch of kit to put on first. And then you're ready to go. The Lule mine is an underground mine reaching to about 230 meters below the surface and the deepest galleries are under the sea level. Access is with a cage lift, quite an exciting experience as these local kids are about to discover. <laughs> and now it's my turn. It only takes a couple of minutes to descend the 230 meters down into the mine through the layers of limestone and gypsum that lay on top of the salt formation. The mine consists of almost 40 kilometers of tunnels under the city of Lule. And it was discovered in the 1950s when survey wells were drilled to try and find some water for agriculture. They did find water, but deeper down it was far saltier than they had expected, unusable for agricultural purposes. But the rock salt offered a new opportunity for the region. So in 1963, the company Kloner carried out a drilling campaign to determine that there was indeed a large amount of rock salt here. The following year, the construction of the mine started and the operations initiated in 1965. At its peak, the production reached over 122,000 tonnes per year, but it is now only about 7,000 tonnes per year, mostly for road gritting and agricultural purposes. That's quite a lot of salt there. But let's now have a look at how these deposits actually form. 
Geologically, salt deposits belong to the type of sedimentary deposits called evaporites. As the name suggests, these form by evaporation of water. Let's see how this works. In normal temperate and wet climates, rainfall is higher than evaporation rates from surface waters such as lakes and inland seas. But if the climate changes and you start getting less and less rainfall, at some point the evaporation will outpace water supply and the lake or the sea starts drying out. When this happens, the waters will get more and more saline until salts start to precipitate onto the bottom. Once the entire body of water has evaporated, all that is left are the salt deposits. These can be huge. The biggest modern one, Sala de Uni in Bolivia, covers an area of 10,000 square kilometers. What type of salts or other evaporites you get depends on what compounds are in the water in the first place. So from inland lakes, you are unlikely to get big salt deposits because the water doesn't contain much salt unless you have, for example, volcanic, mineral-rich water sources nearby, such as are common in active mountain belts like the Andean mountains in South America. So why and when did the salt deposits form at Lule in Portugal? Over 200 million years ago, much of what is now Europe was under an ocean called the Tethys Ocean. The present Western Europe was at the margin of the Tethys Ocean. As the Tethys gradually closed, forming what we know as the Himalayan Alpine mountain belt, the sea level dropped and the Mediterranean Sea got trapped between the European and African continents. The seas in this part of the Tethys were very shallow and sometimes dried out. One such dry period occurred about 230 million years ago when large areas of the shallow western Tethys Ocean dried out. And that's when the salt deposit at Lule formed too. Interestingly, salt never really consolidates like other types of rock. It remains quite mobile, so once buried it can still move. At Lule, geologists think that there is an even deeper salt body that has been partly mobilized due to tectonic movements and it is now forming what is in geology called a salt diapir that penetrates the rock layers above the salt. You can actually see in the complex shapes of the salt layers that it has been deformed because of this flow process. But Portugal produces only a tiny fraction of the salt we use today. We use between 250 and 300 million tons of salt every year. China is currently the largest producer of salt with almost 20% of the global output, followed by the USA and India. Much of the salt we used isn't actually mined from rock salt but produced in seawater evaporation ponds. The process is the same as the natural process of evaporation, so let the water evaporate and leave behind the salt crystals. This is good news in a world where there are concerns for the availability of many other metals and minerals needed in the industry. Because it's so easy to produce salt and oceans and rock salt deposits can be found almost anywhere, we are not going to run out of salt anytime soon. So, salt is actually quite important, not only in terms of nutrition, but for the industry as well. At least, there isn't a shortage of raw material.